Hi there. I'm Catherine Colatello, and I'm going to tell you about felting. I live in Deep River, Ontario. I have been felting for about six years, and I started with courses from a lady in Chalk River, Ontario. Anyway, I get wool from various sources. As a lady in Petawawa has a petting farm, and she has to shear her sheep every year. Although it's washed, it's still quite dirty, and I put it through a, I align it through a carter in order to uh, clean it to some extent and also to align the fibers so that it makes it easier to felt. And you can see on this, I have done a little pre-felt with both of these or pre-felt a felting. So without being carded, this is what you get. You get lumpy wool and, and it's not a very good felted product, although if that's what you want, that's okay. So once you felt, once you card it, which is essentially just combing it, you get a much more uniform product and it is a much more secure uh, result at the end. So that's interesting to see non-carded and carded and see the difference between the two. You could make rugs and as long as it's a secure thing, this is a nice, you get lots of texture. If you don't want the texture, then you have it aligned and straightened up. I get a large tub of head hot water and just regular dish soap. And I put it into bags, uh, laundry type bags with holes in it, like cheesecloth. And I let it soak for about an hour. And you don't want to agitate it because if you move the, the, felt, the, the wool around, it will felt on itself. So maybe I need to back up a little bit. Sheep's wool is a really interesting product or interesting fiber because every piece of wool has little shafts on it, little sub shafts. And each of those shafts tangle with the ones beside it. So when you have this tangling, that's essentially felting. That's what they use for spinning uh, to get the fibers to twist together and you, it will just lock really. And it's kind of a one-way system where that, uh, like a fishing hook, the fibers go in and then they lock. They can't go back out or they have difficulty going back out. And the more you work it, the less it will come apart. So when you wash it, you just want to wash, dunk it in the water, let it sit there. It's not too hot. You don't agitate it as in you don't stir it very much. And that essentially lets the fibers, the extra stuff, the veggie matter they call it, which is the hay, anything from the barn that is a coating the fibers as well as lanolin, they, that soap sloughs off. Then you pull it out and then you rinse it in a vinegar wash and that lets the soap leave. And you have uh, fairly clean fibers. And I, my, when I card it, I still get veggie matter coming out of the system because the way I wash it, it's, it's not, I don't wash it enough. I'd have to do that multiple, multiple times. And for my work, that's not necessary. So I know when you have a professionally uh, washed fibers, they probably put some other chemicals in it in order to dissolve the veggie matter. So they use, and so their wool is much cleaner than my wool when it's finished. Uh, here's an example of professionally washed fibers. Hold it now. So there's very little veggie matter. This has been dyed. The very little veggie matter in it. Uh, it's all uniform in space. My sheep that I have are not really a type of sheep. They're a blend. They're a farmyard sheep that's not really as well put together as the professional dyes. So they, um, they'll they sort through it and the process they use is much more mechanized. Not any more tough, just a lot more of it to clean it up. And then they dye it professionally. So uh, you get a different look. Uh, here's a good example. So here's a professional, I don't have close to you, here's a professional wool and there's my wool. So you can see this is much smoother. It's also longer fibers, but it's a much better, uh, a much better to work with from a felting point of view and a spinning point of view. 
uh, theirs is, uh, uh, it, it, that's just, that's how it is. So I could work with both. As a felter, I could work with both. I think someone who spins couldn't do what I do because probably 25% of the work I do is by own wool and 75% of the wool that I sell is per purchased wool. It's much better to work with, it felts better, it's a known quantity, and if I'm going to sell it, I'd prefer to have things that I know is professionally dyed as opposed to me dyeing it. Uh, it's just more, uh, what's the word, it is, uh, I, I know the outcome. And when you felt there's a lot of unknowns, and so when you work with your own wool, unless I knew of the sheep, you know, if I knew that I had merino sheep, I could probably do it myself, but I don't have access to that in this county. So I just have farmyard lens. So that's how I work. Dyeing is not something I do a lot of, although I have. Uh, I have some friends who are really good at this dyeing thing. So we had a dyeing workshop, and this is indigo, which is the blue that you get uh, from, uh, anyway, it's a plant that is grown. We grow it here uh, as the weavers group, and that was used the indigo. This pink has been dyed using uh, the outside of bugs. It's a particular bug. Don't remember the name of it, but I can find it. And this is uh, like delphidiums. Oh, and uh, marigolds. We have marigold uh, fiber. But it's interesting, when I've dyed this myself, the wool is different than the dyes, the professional dyes. As in, the te it feels different. It uh, has a different texture. Uh, altogether, a different product. So you... Uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting journey to see how, if I was in days gone by, these are all old, very ancient techniques, and what we what we have developed with our current technology is a really slick procedure, whereas that's not what you would have experienced back in the day. Dry wool. Uh, again, I I lay it out. I've got a airing tray, I guess, and if it's a sunny day. And that's what you want. I would put the wool horizontal on that, put it outside, and let it drip through. And again, you have to be careful because it will fly away if you're not good at it. Uh, or I have a heated surface in the house that I could put that on and that will heat up. Uh, that will dry out the wool. But it all has to happen. It takes about a, a day for the wool to dry. And some people dry it in bags. Uh, Again, if it's windy and hot and dry, you could do it. Uh, if it's not, then it's gonna take longer, as you would well imagine. You, you, you're always protecting the wool from felting because once it felts, uh, it's very difficult to take it apart and use it again because these, these shafts, these individual shafts, start to adhere to the other pieces of the other shafts and they don't unlock. So you have to be, uh, careful enough with it uh, because I can't use it for spinning or for felting. People couldn't use it for spinning. So it, it just, you have to be very nice to it until you're ready to use it. Uh, every sheep type, and there's I don't know, a couple hundred of them, has a particular, they call it a staple length. So uh, just like people, I, you probably don't know this, but people hair grows to particular lengths depending on their genetic inheritance. So just like sheep, uh, their hair, their fur, their, their wool will grow to a particular length. So the meat sheep generally have a much shorter length because they're not growing for their wool. And I think this has also changed over they've bred them to be this way. So they, you don't necessarily have to shear them uh, as often as a, like a burrito, which is the top, which is a very nice wool for spinning, has a nice staple length of maybe four or five inches. Whereas a meat sheep, it may just be this long. And also some sheep have a, you know, just like people, they've got curly hair and they've got straight hair. So you just, there's those variations. <coughs> so a spinning, oh, sorry, someone who's spinning would probably want to use their wool uh, the longer the better. Because when you're spinning, you're actually attaching one piece to the other and you want that overlap. 
and there's less work the longer the each leg, staple legs, then there's less work for the person spitting to have to worry about it attaching on. Otherwise, you're just off, you're very often attaching it to each other. As for felting, uh, different felting projects uh, require different uh, lengths of wool. So there's two types of felting. There's wet felting and there's needle felting. And I find when I wet felting, I want my pieces long so that I get overlap and smooth, it's smooth. However, when I'm needle felting, I don't really worry about it because I'm putting the needle in uh, to, a to make a particular look or uh, picture. And if it's, not, if it's too long, then I, it kind of gets bunched up and it's, it's sort of in the way, the length of the wool. Where if it's short, uh, I can use it like paint. And I could just put a bit here and a bit there and I don't have too much to deal with. And I don't mind it crinkly. I don't mind it short uh, when I'm needle felting. I sort of prefer that. But again, it depends on the picture. So different, uh, different projects will require different lengths of wool. And you kind of have to figure that out. So what I do in order to do my pictures, this is wool that I would have washed and carded. And you can see that it's quite rough texture. Uh, it didn't all felt. Is this a pre-felt? This is a very gentle felt. So I, I'm ready to put a picture on top of it. So this is a logger fiber and this is a professionally washed uh, product and carded. As you see, so you can see really, I mean there's little bits of uh, texture here. There's very little texture in that different type of sheep but also this is uh, this is the desirable look uh, if if you want. But this is more what people are used to. This is this works too. You just have a different it has a different function. That's all. So let's see now. I want to show you. So what I start with. So there's so th these are two pieces here. These are set to the same state. It's just it's wool that's been dyed. I made a little very light felting of this and then what I do is I will make a picture on top and then I will put more water and soap on it and agitate it and then it becomes a finished product and it will shrink it will shrink about 30 percent in the felting so the needles I use are not like the needles you're used to they're super sharp and they have Sorry. They have little notches on them. I don't know if you can see the notches there. Not really. And there's notches. There's three notches. And it's very, very sharp. And so those notches, uh, I take a bit of wool. And essentially, I could, uh, what I do is, I, this is needle felting, whereas I push the wool in, but it doesn't, it's not dragged out. So it's a one-way trip is what I call it. I, I, it's, it's just lightly, I could still, I could still take it off if I want to redo the picture. Try to do something real fast here. So this is what I do is this is, uh, I kind of, if I want to make a tulip of sorts. And you see how this log wool, it kind of, kind of gets in the way. But if I've got a short pieces, they uh, they kind of they don't get in the way of the of the photo of the photo or the, the picture I'm looking for. So this is just being pushed down into the felt. It's just being pushed in. Yes. Yeah. It's yeah. So uh, if you did this enough, it would become a sort of a finished product. But I don't do that enough. That's so. This you kind of have a a flower of sorts. Give it a stem. Give it some leaves, and you can all add all sorts of nuances as you go along. Yes, I'm really painting with wool, and so by doing it this way, uh, I could add a uh, little little bit of uh, shadows, give it a little more interest. So you have the light coming from this direction. So you're gonna have out. So when you have it light, you're gonna what to show where the light's coming from. 
uh, and you start and you the approach is just like painting where you start from the back and then you work to the front so that's uh, and depending on your ability you could do all sorts of uh, differences to it and make all sorts of changes so what I do is I generally either I take pictures on my camera, on my phone camera when I'm walking about, or I see pictures on the internet and I will do what I would call an interpretation. So I will look at what somebody, a drawing of what somebody's doing, and I generally have to simplify it because of the, the limits of wool and my limits as well. So uh, you would, you have an idea of what you're doing and I would do the essential, the form, the background, it, on the wool, and then I, then I kind of build it up as I move along. So it's this picture here, I did this morning, and it's supposed to be lady slippers, and so I start with the background, add some trees, add some shade and, and, uh, and light, and then I develop the lady slippers. I essentially approach it like a painting. Whereas I look at the background, I see what's back there, and then you just layer it on top and add shade and add uh, other things. So, so that is for, for that sort of stuff. But the, the wool is very, very versatile, and you could do three-dimensional project, three-dimensional objects with it. One thing that is fairly popular in my world is I make tea cozies. So if I make a tea cozy, it's a two-sided object. So I take a form that I've made, that I've cut out, because that's all I've got, is, uh, and you would, so here's lay the wool on top of each other. So this way you uh, have the max, maximum amount of adhering to, to itself. Then you turn it all over, and then you, you uh, flatten out what's curving on there and then you add more wool over that and then when you're done you open it up and you have a you have a, a product you have an item that has a a well in the center and essentially that is becomes a tea cozy or it could become a hat it could be a piece of clothing it's versatile and you can add stuff to it as well you could have little pointy bits coming out of it as well so I've done little animals that have ears on them and tails and fins and it's all done in that pre-felting state where it's ready to adhere to something else and it, and it allows you to the way you felt it it will go together looking like a three-dimensional three-dimensional item there's many forms of this carding. So these are old original ones, hand carders, C-A-R-D-E-R-S, and it's essentially just two combs where you put the wool and you, you do this with it, and that's straight. You're essentially just aligning the fibers. Like these ones here, each of the nails is bent a bit, so it has an angle uh, to it, so it's not, to touch it, it's not pointy because each, each of the nails sort of has a bend. So I gotta put this through. I also have a, uh, I do have a dangerous machine up there, uh, but that, that you can't hurt yourself with. So here I am, and you can see that, uh, I gotta put that up. So you can see the wool is being taken up on the big drum. And you can see dirt coming out, even though I've done this before, it's still lots of dirt. So this is essentially just aligning the fibers. And this is age old work. So you can see that. And then I will take them off. And here's little uh, carters, but they're locked dog brushes, that's all they are. <laughs> right? They charge you big bucks for these, but you don't really need them. Anyway, so you can see how that little bit of wool 
I take it off. And this is how it would blend colors as well. I'll, I'll, maybe I'll do that. That might be interesting to look at. But this is essentially aligning the fibers. And if you were spinning, you would want this to be in good shape. It doesn't require any further processing. At this point, it's ready for me for, for felting. So I pull it apart, bits and pieces, and I just, as you saw earlier, I lay it on top of itself. And then I add water and soap, and I agitate it, which I can show you that. And that will show you, that will tell you, that, sorry, that will get it to the felted state. So for me, I am done processing the wool, unless I want to make it into a color. So although I buy wool that has, is different colors, I could just go with the three primary colors of yellow, blue, and red, and I could make all my own colors. So you also have to have a bit of a knowledge of color theory, because I want to have subtle changes in the color. Take this, and I put it beside each other. And so I gotta put it out here. And it may have to go through the carding machine a couple times, but you can see how it's blending. Even on this. So what started out as two distinct colors has kind of blended in the middle in particular. So if I want a particular color and I don't have that, then I can make it. But I have to understand how colors go together, right? So, uh, and I have a, I have, I've sort of taken a couple of courses and I have a color wheel and that helps me too. I made a tea cozy where I started with blue and then I moved up to green and I just continued adding colors to the blue. Uh, that yellow, yellow would get me a green. And then I sort of ran out of the blue and I had this bluey green and then I added uh, uh, red and then I started getting purple and stuff like that. So, and I add black and that also gives me a darkness or white if I want it lighter. So you can see that's quite different than when we started. And when I pull it apart, when I'm making it into wool, so you can see that's really well blended right there. I really like color. I really am, I am very much excited by the color. So I would make tulips out of something like this, uh, just because it has that tulipy feel to it, or a fall, a fall flower, maybe a sunflower. And I also like working with colors that I don't necessarily understand, if that makes any sense to you. So I'm always fascinated to work with those, to learn uh, how that's supposed to work so that I just get more adept at it. I get better at doing it. So the weaving group grows plants uh, in their garden at the other end of town, Bill Rounding Park. They grow indigo, they grow a cosmos, sulfur cosmos they call them, uh, dahlias, uh, woad, and weld. So those are all, either they use the flowers or the leaves. This is sulfur cosmos, so you take the, the flowers and you, you essentially make a tea out of this. So you hot water and then the, the flowers come out with the color and they, um, they dye the, the water. And these, this is this, oh, oh, that's not Cosmos. This is a bug at, that you crush bugs. Uh, Cochamil, they're called. Cochamil bugs. Uh, you crush the beetles, you crush it with a mortar pestle, make a tea out of it again, and then you heat it up. And when you, when you die, you always have to use a, a mordant. And that is a product that helps the dye adhere to the, either the wool or the cotton or the silk. So uh, you put it, the mordant in first, and it could be, uh, so usually it's a different, like it changes the pH. So you could use alum. Alum's a good one. How's that? Alum's good or vinegar. And that allows the fibers to change the pH and then you dunk them into the uh, color dye, the bath, for a length of time, however long you want it. And the fibers, because their pH has been changed, and they will absorb the colors. Yeah, but we're very fortunate. Although we don't have uh, a lot of natural products, we have people who are pretty knowledgeable about the dyeing process, uh, the felting, and the spitting, uh, and the weaving. 
So I have uh, laid out there what I have questions because there's a lot of overlap in the knowledge base. And I learn just as much as I need to. And so uh, when I have, they tell me too much, I just tell them, that's good, we're all, all set, bye bye. And then I go back to them knowing that they're a good source of information. So Lois Friedman was really good about helping me with the carding, showed me how to do that. Uh, and there's another, uh, that, I think that's it for uh, the, the artisans co-op, but there's a weaving and spinning group here that's been going on since 1965. And it has, uh, it's got a lot of master uh, weavers in it, and they and you have to know all about wool and dyeing and spinning and the textures of wool. I try to differentiate between wet and dry, because once it gets wet, the wool is just need, it needs time to dry. So I can't be doing two things. The two things have to happen separately. So if I am, so this is soapy water. Uh, and you don't want to dump the water on there. You want it to be sort of uh, evenly spaced. So this is a little feature from Lee Valley. It's for watering plants or spraying leaves. But it's just, it said she's got a bunch of holes on it. And it's a big bulb. And I get the whole thing wet. I happen to use soap from France because it has, it's olive oil soap, and it's got a lot of fat in it. So I buy these squares, and it's soft on your hands. I put it on a bubbled, bubble wrap because it has uh, texture again, and it adds to the agitation. So it kind of amplifies what I do. It's, it's just, it's a, it's a varied surface. A raised, I'm sorry, it's a raised surface, but it's not uh, consistent. It just enhances the agitation so that it's not, I don't have to rely totally on me to do, but I could do this. I could just do this sort of stuff. But what seems to work better is I roll it up. I use pantyhose or anything, but this, this a pantyhose works well. Sockets, they call them. And, uh, and then you just do this for quite a long, well, not a super long time. You have to kind of be light at the beginning in order to create a surface. And then as you, as you felt more and more, you can become much more um, tough with it. I'll, I'll show you an example of that that's better than this. What you want to do is you want to evenly agitate it. So you can see I've done it this way. And what, what started out as a square is now more of a rectangle. Uh, so this would have been uh, so Anyway, so what I do is I turn it around. And that way I do four sides, and that will evenly felt it. Otherwise, it, but you know, it depends on what you're wanting. If you want it to be long and thin, then you just felt it in one direction. So generally you do sort of a hundred of each. It's not as important. These bug mats are pretty small, but the bigger the product, the more work it is. So that's squared off a little bit. Yeah, that's not too bad. Uh, so I'm going to do it. Uh, so what was interesting, I see the way you felt it is the way it's going to square up. This is a little too much water in it. So it's, it's tough enough now, you can kind of do some stuff. So you can see, they call it the pitch test is that what, was on, what used to look like this is now become one with the background. So this is, you know, it's a, now a piece of wool as opposed to this where I could actually tear it apart. And I could pull that off as well. There's no pulling that off anymore. And this is another form of uh, just agitation, but these, if you, this is quite knobbly. It's knobbly. So there it's rinsed out. And I'll show you what, what I have, what I do, because it's fun. Tossed it. And you can see water against the sides. Stop it. And so you wouldn't, well, there's not a lot in, but there's enough water in there. 
uh, and then it dries at no time. After care, what I will sometimes do, depending on what I think it should look like, I will go over with a needle again, just to give it a little more texture. Because it does, as you say, it gets flattened out. And if I don't always like everything, the way it's, it's felted, so you could go through it like this, and you could give it a little more uh, texture to it. And you could sort of hide things, or you could add a few things if you want to. And that makes things stand out. You can kind of give it a little more texture. Because I've done it in one piece, uh, it just makes it, it's a very well put together. I call this a dog dogfish, yeah. And there's a catfish. Looks like my cat, right? So that's my beagle dog that we used to have. This is the cat. So it's interesting to do it this way because you could see uh, partial felting and then I attach it and, and then that, it kind of comes out this way. Uh, so this is something that actually is a couple pieces. This was done, like it looked like that to start with. And then I did add an embellishment later to sort of improve it. And then I added this piece and that's needle felted there. Anyway, so that's just a little guy going down the water. That was actually on a display. And this was a really fancy piece here. Wow. So this so this is it uh, showing how you give it a lot of texture. And so the gray part would be pre-felted. I do stitching in between, and then I fill the stitches, I fill the, the baubles with uh, wool, and I could cut the top off it, or I could put lines into it. It gives the impression of the water when it's fast water. And then I joined this, these two pieces together afterwards and needle felted the canoeists, uh, kayakers on top. And this is, uh, this is locally sourced wool. The white and the gray is from Petawawa. So uh, it was when the Petawawa was high a few years ago and that gave me the idea of this. I think it captures that, the, the tumult. It had the bubble, like the water's like it's churning, bubbling up, right, so fast. But then it can be calm as well, outside of the area that's all rough. So, The only thing I can't do, I can't make a car out of steel wool. That's my only limit. <laughs>